Well, I have a treat for you today on today's podcast. I'm going to interview Timo Shelley. Timo is short for Timothy, which I just learned. Never thought about that. But Timo and his wife, Marie, or Mary, I think uh, kind of can go both ways. They're from, uh, Timo is from France, and uh, Marie is from, I believe, uh, Ireland. Um, but they are missionaries, and they have been to 40 countries and have seen many remarkable things. We learned about them through a mutual friend, uh, Chris, so thank you, Chris, uh, who t- told us about their podcast of reaching, or their their documentary, I should say, of reaching the unreached people groups, particularly uh, in this documentary, it's about reaching the pygmy tribes in Africa, and it was a really remarkable documentary. I'm going to include a link of it uh, in the description of this show if I for some reason forget. Be sure to remind me in the comments, and I will post a link to that. Um, but there, the documentary was very powerful, very moving, very inspiring, and it just seemed so well-rounded uh, in their ministry approach, where they preach the gospel, they deliver uh, physical, they they meet physical needs, and then they also do deliverance, which radically changes people's lives um, as people are set free from demonic influence, and uh, you can see the fruit of the Spirit throughout the video in a remarkable way, where a whole people group is being changed by the gospel, which is always the goal of the gospel. So the reason I'd have Timo here on this podcast is because the faith of the fathers is about um, getting back to the roots of who we are called to be before Jesus. What is this faith of our fathers really about? And every generation has this task of kind of going back to Jesus, clearing away Um, All the added stuff, which everybody comes with added stuff, you know, uh, religion adds stuff, culture adds stuff. And Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So we always have to work at pushing away the distractions, pushing away the extra weights, pushing away the things that uh, clog up the simple truth of the gospel so we can walk in freedom. But what I see in Timo and Marie's life is is the fruit of the Spirit and that they they have helped establish a church among the pygmy tribes that is bearing the fruit of the Spirit, that is bringing healing and hope to people who have none. Um, so today, I don't want to, in this interview, I'm not rehashing the uh, information that you see in the documentary. I encourage you to watch that. I also encourage you to watch uh, their video about how their son, their little son, died and came back to life. Literally, he was drowned and had and had been dead for um, a little while before God brought him back from the dead. Timo told me that it was very difficult to make this that video and that their son actually smelled like death for a little while afterwards. That they actually had to, had had to wrestle with grief um, after the event, even though their son was running around. That's how real it was. Even though their son was running around alive. They still felt like they had lost them because they had experienced that death in such a real way. This was a real resurrection from the dead. We're not covering that in this interview. We're covering the story of Timo, how God shaped him into the man that he is, how he became someone willing to go to the African tribes or the Amazon or wherever God leads them, saying yes to him, forsaking all, and becoming someone who has enough faith to see miracles. Uh, to see the power and the working of God. So Timo has a lot to share, and so we're going to get right into this interview, but I just wanted to give that as a way of introduction. If you um, want to hear Timo in person, he's going to be at our at our church, the Father's House, on November 10th at 10 a.m. Um, if you want to know more about that, you can um, send me an email at my website, carlgessler.com. Um, and so anyway, he's going to be there in person, um, and I encourage you again to check out his documentary. But now we're going to get into this interview, and here we go. Nice. Well, I'm here with uh, a new friend, Timo Shelley, and uh, welcome to the podcast, Timo. Thank you so much. We, we're going to have, well, actually, hopefully we still will have you come to our church and share, but uh, for those of you who have been following, you know that our area was absolutely wrecked by Hurricane Helena, um, so that we had no power when you were supposed to come last Wednesday. We had... I don't think people could have even gotten to the building because the roads were so smashed up. But I uh, wanted to have Timo on here today because uh, we watched this documentary. Um, he and his wife Marie went into uh, to reach the Pygmy tribes. 
successfully. You guys, you guys have been missionaries in multiple places, mm -hmm. um, and so I don't want to rehash the the documentary. I want to encourage you to go watch that. And what is what is the name of it again? The so it's called the Unreached, uh, a family's mission to reach the pygmies. It is about an hour long, and it's well worth it. We watched it as a family. And also we watched a short testimony that you had of um, losing your son briefly who went after he drowned and God brought him back to life. Amen. This is the kind of story I like to highlight on this podcast just to say Jesus is alive. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That when he said, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, preach the gospel, he meant it. Um, so, But we don't want to necessarily, I'm sure we'll overlap some in the information, but not just to regurgitate the the uh, documentary, but to hear your story, Timo, of like, uh, how did you get to this place where you and your wife live a really radical life um, for the gospel? I mean, you're here in the United States. This isn't your home country. Uh, tell us about Timo. Like, how did how did you encounter Jesus? Um, how did you end up uh, where you are today? Yeah, so um, I grew up in France and uh, to a British father uh, who was also a missionary. I mean, he was more missionary, the more ordinary term of like going and being sent by an, a mission organization. And so as a very young age, I would go with him. He would smuggle Bibles into Morocco, into Algeria, going even when it was a civil war in Algeria, going to visit the Brotherhood, the, the different Muslims who came to Christianity. and. So he did a lot of dangerous things also, and uh, he actually he received his call being hit by a, a lorry, a lorry, which is a truck. Yeah, a truck. truck. Yeah. He was hit by a truck while he was walking uh, in Algeria, which is a Moroccan, uh, an Arabic uh, country, Muslim country, and uh, he was left dead by the side of the road. And uh, this is it when was he... an, it was an accident, or was that intentional? accidental okay. but the man drove away he didn't want to have any problems uh, wow. hitting a, a French man <laughs> wow so my dad woke up in the hospital and uh, I think he was like nearly a, yeah, a few weeks in coma and so his uh, his family was really worried of him it was back in the days where there was no like cell phone no you couldn't really have news you know if someone went out to seas like that so that's how he received his call uh, so I was growing up, being inspired also by what he did, and he also brought me twice to Siberia in Russia, in Siberia. So wow, how old were you when you did that? So I was eight, and then I was twelve. So at a very young age, I saw I was disconnected from the Western world in Siberia, and it was a big shock for me, you know. Were you an only child? Do you have siblings? Uh, I have uh, three other. I'm the last of four. Okay. So I have a big brother and two big sisters and uh, but they were more grown up actually and so I was traveling alone with my parents in Siberia and that was a big shock for me to be disconnected from the Western world and that's also what was also because I was very Im like immature and very um, disrespectful at school I was creating a lot of problems because me I was growing up I, I grew up with a lot of depression Mm. because my mom uh, on her side has a lot of mentally mental sickness my mom was bipolar her brother was bipolar and schizophrenic her other brother bipolar and schizophrenic her sister was schizophrenic so really a big like depression mental sickness mm. and I grew up with uh, a lot of darkness uh, even though they believed in Jesus they believed in Jesus but uh, there was a lot of darkness in my childhood uh, I lost my niece from cancer at nine months old, wow. and um, yeah, I would I would be attacked at night with many nightmares. I would even think it was demonic attacks. Like uh, I remember one of these scary dreams I had. I didn't know if I was sleeping or awake, where death, like the the death, came in my room with a sickle, and put the sickle on my chest. And when it he was putting the sickle on my chest, it was like piercing my ears, like. Uh, very piercing noise. So you saw, you kind of saw this in the spirit, or like a dream, or I could, I can't say if, if yeah, it was a dream, but it felt so like I was awake, mm -hmm. and uh, I was trying to switch on the light when it was happening. <laughs> so, wow. 
So uh, I was very attacked at uh, as a young age. You, I wanted to ask you two things, uh, which is uh, one, how did you feel and how did your siblings feel about your dad's missional, dangerous lifestyle? Um, and two, where do you think that darkness mm -hmm. um, came from? So it was not all, all beautiful, you know, even if my dad was doing the work of God and going and doing these things. There was uh, very dark things that happened when my dad was a very forgiving man. So what happened is that he had a friend that he interested, he trusted him because this man was known to be a, a, have abused children or very uh, dark things like that. But he came to the church and he was repentant and he, he wanted to change his life quote unquote and my dad trusted him and believed him but hopefully he didn't abuse my sister but he was like uh, like uh, it was he was really a, a bad influence and in many ways and he was praying over my sister in a very evil way so um, my sister grew up with kind of bitterness towards my dad that he uh, he uh, was absent sometimes because he was on the mission field he was in Africa and I mean not in Africa in Morocco and Algeria. She felt unprotected. Yeah, so I grew up with a lot of confusion and as much my parents were very, uh, very uh, loved people, loved God and as much as they saw, there was also confusion in some of the, the doctrine that my parents believed, like they would pray with Catholics also sometimes. So that's where I see that there was these evil spirits coming in and because mm -hmm. the Lord uh, Clearly in his word, he's very, uh, very serious about sin and about different things and compromise. So I believe there was compromise also in my bringing and it opened the doors to, to very dark things in the house. Or do you mean that with just for clarification for people like mm -hmm. praying with Catholics, you mean like there, I think I would, we would agree on this, that there are um, in certain ways in the Catholic Church that the kind of praying that they can do when it comes to praying to saints tips over into like almost what you could probably call occultic mm -hmm. praying is that what you're referring to it was more they were trying to to consider them yeah as their brothers and 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 in that way and inviting them but it was they were nobody was changing nobody was repenting or coming to the lord when they were doing this as an approach to actually reach them for take them out of their traditions and all these things but uh, that was an approach they were taking and uh, that could be one of the things I don't know everything that my parents did at that time why the darkness was there but hopefully uh, I did I started my own journey also reading the Bible searching the truth because myself I had seen in my life I'm not <laughs> blaming my parents also for all the darkness myself uh, because also I, I was taught a, a gospel that, you know, we are sinners and we can continue this way, it's okay. You have, we all have sins in our life, we can continue. It, it was not very radical repentance. There was no mention really of repentance from a young age of holiness, of fear of the Lord. And uh, growing up, so with my friends, I would have bad influences going into the world, into many different sins. And, the loss of the flesh and sexual immorality and many different things. You didn't know probably many Christians in, in France. There was uh, some Christians, but it was very lukewarm, very lukewarm where it was, you know, we believe in Jesus, but he saved us, but there was no change, there was no repentance, there was no victory over sin. So this is what I grew up in, uh, but I started to really want to read the Bible because uh, I was very depressed also, like I said, and I wanted to know the light but it was very hard because growing up in France where everybody tells you God doesn't exist and I'm here defending that no no Jesus exists but then I, after thinking about it I'm like okay but why did God choose me to know the truth you know it was too good to be true and that's when also my brothers and sisters influenced me with they were starting to depart a bit from the faith also it was influencing me and it was too good to be true you know like heaven and the streets of gold and the New Jerusalem and the, I wanted this you know it was all my body my soul was craving for this this better world this this eternal salvation but it, in my doubts and my unbelief I just was like it's too good to be true 
But what happened is uh, actually when I was really thinking that it's too good to be true, uh, at a meeting, there was a, a meeting where someone received, uh, there's some people in the room who has depression and God wants you to come forward. And I went forward and a woman that didn't know me from Adam and Eve, that's with in French, they don't, didn't know me at all. She came to me and she said, uh, Timothy, I uh, feel God uh, sees you have many questions. He wants you really to become his son and to, to be at peace. And she left, or and that was the first time in my life I saw God. It's not the God of my parents, but He's starting to speak to me. And that's when I started to be very serious reading the Bible, and I wanted to read from cover to cover the entire Bible, knowing who is this God. And um, that's when I started to read many, many verses that I never heard before. Uh, for example, when, when Jesus says, uh, many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't I heal the sick, cast out demons, do many mighty works in your name, and he will tell them, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Many radical verses that I never heard going to church. And I was like, this is very serious, and this is when I started to feel that it's so important to follow Christ instead of following men and traditions, because I started to see that there was so much traditions of men, and and there was no, I was not seeing any conversions in uh, where I grew up. Nobody was actually being uh, born again or new. There was actually more people dying in that church I grew up in than people being saved. Mm. So I started to feel like this is, is, there is something wrong here. And I was praying for the Lord to guide me to the right people. And uh, he guided me to, to some people who was also very wanting to save the lost. And this is when we started to do a lot of evangelism, going in, out in the streets and meeting in parks, just in the parks, very simple, meeting in the houses like we see a bit in the book of Acts. And um, I actually got baptized, I really repented from all these sin that was holding on to me. That was um, also thanks to a dream God gave me because I was known as a radical Christian, you know, by many of my friends who was Christian. They were like, oh, Timothy is very radical. But I knew in my life I was hiding some sins. I was keep holding on to some uh, immorality and things in my life. And uh, God gave me a dream to really uh, separate me, to take me out of this. And in that dream, it was very scary. I was with my friends in that dream and I felt dead in my dream suddenly. And as I felt dead, I saw my soul come out of my body and I was brought to a place of total darkness and I thought, uh, so I cried out, God! You know, I was expecting the light to come and the salvation, but unfortunately it was a deep silence and I started to fall and to fall and to fall and in that moment my thoughts were so loud and I knew it was because of my sin that I was separated from God forever and ever and it was, uh, there's no words you can describe this, it's, it's really um, there's no words to describe how I felt in that dream. And I woke up and then I fell on my knees and I was, God, what are you trying to show me? I'm a Christian, what is happening? And uh, then I opened my Bible to some of the verses I mentioned, how Jesus really wants us to be set apart. He wants us to live, to be holy as he is holy and to depart from iniquity, from sins. And uh, that was a big wake-up call for me because, you know, many people would clap and say, Oh, your testimony was so great. Timothy is a radical Christian, you know. Mm. But it really doesn't matter what people think about us. What matters is right. that God sees through anything and everything. Mm. And that brought me to a deeper humility to see that uh, I don't want to seek man's approval, but I want to seek God's approval because I accept him. But what matters is that he will accept me and say, Come into my rest, you good and faithful servant. And so, um, yeah. What, what was the difference in that you would say then between the Timothy that people thought was radical to the one that you became? Like what, what changed? Would you call it surrender, baptism, uh, being filled with the Spirit, truly being converted? How, what, what would you... Yeah, it was most of these things, mo most of it, but it was also to, to not uh, hold on to some sins that I was holding on to in my life that mm. clearly I had to let go that that was done in the secret you know it's not something yeah. that was public again so it's easy on the public to be yeah. seen as an amazing uh, believer yeah. radical but what the Lord looks at is a secret yeah. the secret what was I doing and, 
And so that's really uh, what the Lord wanted to reveal through that dream. Mm. And after that, uh, I continued uh, on my walk and very young, at 17, the Lord was starting to give me responsibilities like organizing the big march of Jesus, which was a big event uh, in Toulouse, where a man calls me and said, I'm looking for someone to organize the march for Jesus. And me, I was really faithful in the little things, preaching the gospel everywhere I would go. And then when I received this call of organizing a big march of Jesus that would organize all the churches, unite all the different churches from the city, which is a big city, like of 500,000 inhabitants. It was like, wow, the Lord sees what I, the little things that I do. And that was one of the most beautiful days of my life when we were walking in the street, preaching Jesus, singing, thousands of people walking in the street with music. This is in France. Yeah, in so, France. Wow. So people, they were taking pictures, videos, they saw the joy and they, they never saw something like this. So that wow. was amazing. And then, uh, so the evangelism, people were coming from all over France, Switzerland, to receive training on how to go out, heal the sick, and baptize, cast out demons. And this was, I was only 17 at the time that I did my first baptism and baptized a, a deaf and dumb man. And when he was baptized, he said that uh, that same day he heard the trumpet when he was deaf and dumb. He heard a trumpet. So I, I did thousands of wow. baptism, but I still remember that very first baptism. Did did he continue to hear afterwards or it was just like he heard trumpets at that moment? No, he, he remained uh, deaf and dumb. We prayed for him, we didn't see that, that miracle. Uh, even though we saw other miracles, we didn't see breakthrough in that for him. But he did hear a trumpet in the middle of the night. Mm. And he woke up and he stand up like, what is happening? <laughs> wow, interesting. So yeah, there was a lot of miracles and my life really was changed from the time of the growing up in traditions where I would only see people like speaking about their testimonies and actually seeing them. And that was uh, amazing for me. How did, how did you begin to see the miracles that you heard about? Did they just start to happen or did, you, did your approach to ministry change? So actually uh, there was a, a, a man who came from Sweden to come and uh, train us to show us how to go, to lay hands on the sick in the streets, to not be afraid, to command the pain to go and to really take authority, not to, to ask God, please help them and close your eyes, but really to command, I command this pain to go in Jesus' name. And, and really lay, lay hands on, he was bringing us in the streets, let's go, let's do this, and that's how it, it happened. Um, I actually, before he came, I, really want, I, I couldn't wait for him to come, so I started myself uh, in the streets of England, and I saw the first people being healed, and that was life-changing for me to see actually the power of the, like, G, like Paul says, I didn't come with words, but in power. Yeah. And the people were being like, what, I don't have pain, what, my stomach problem left. And they were much more open to hearing the message after being healed from these little pains. So that's my first love. And even talking about it right now, I, 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 I want to cherish and keep that first love. Because it's true, now, now I moved on a bit in terms of healing is not as a big part for me. Because I saw so many people healed that did not come to repentance. So now I... I I really, I believe that as much, the most important is the message of repentance because even like we see Jesus prayed for the 10 lepers and only one comes back and that's what okay. I experienced. So many people being healed from crutches who couldn't walk and different things. But even that, that didn't lead their, their heart to, to fully commit and repent and follow the Lord. Mm. So after that, uh, I felt... Um, this calling uh, that was coming little by little uh, of, of going, you know, and seeing what would do if, what would happen if I leave all of my securities to follow uh, Christ, you know, and because I read in Luke chapter 10, he was saying, look at the bird, they do not sow, they do not reap. The Lord takes care of the birds, go therefore and, you know, put the kingdom first, everything else will be added unto you. Don't take uh, money bags, don't take money clothes. So I didn't have that faith, I did took some spare clothes with me, <laughs> but uh, I did uh, leave my job, I was an entertainer for children, that's, so it's a job where you, you take care of kids in different primary schools. I loved my job at the time, and I, so I felt to leave my job, leave my studies, leave my bank account, uh, my phone number, and really uh, 
go and see what would happen. I had uh, very little money on the side. And actually, uh, what was one of the confirmations for me when I received a postcard from my grandmother, who's not really a believer uh, from England, and in that postcard, I saw a young man with a backpack facing a beautiful lake and a big mountain behind the lake. And I felt this little voice, not a loud voice, but in my heart, like the Lord was telling me, this is a mountain that the Lord wants you to climb up. This is a mountain of your life. It's a big, the big call of your life. But before, you must walk on water, and there's a lake before uh, this mountain. But again, it was not an audible voice. It was just a little thought, the little dream that I had in my heart that this is possible, that we can live for Christ and see, uh, you know, go into the nations. Because as a kid, uh, I would hear the song, to the ends of the earth, to the end of the earth will shall go. And I would dance to that song. And that was my dream, but it, it was too good to be true. As I said, I still had this unbelief because me, I thought my life would be only depression and my parents die and me being sick like my niece died. And, you know, I thought my life would be only death and uh, failure and no light, you know. But I, I, I hold on to that little card and that little promise. And uh, at a, um, a meeting we were having in the house fellowship, someone who also didn't know me, she said, uh, I see you uh, on a cliff and the Lord is telling you, jump, trust me. And, um, and I see you not doing a beautiful jump, but just throwing yourself down that, <laughs> down that cliff. And that's exactly what the Lord wants from you. So I said, what? You don't know what I'm about to do. I just, I'm preparing to leave everything. And so it was really the Lord encouraged me in that. And I also went to my parents asking them, uh, you know, dad, I want to leave everything. Is that a good idea? And my dad, who is a man of faith, he told me, you know, yeah, if it's that's what you have on your heart, you know. So he encouraged me. My mom, it was another story. She was a bit more stressed. Like, what is going to happen? He had yeah. a nice job, a nice, every, everything was set up for him. And <laughs> he leaves everything. What? <laughs> so uh, I left everything. And one of the first houses I go to is uh, for my uncle in England. And my little nephew gives me a cup of milk. And as I'm drinking the cup of milk, I see at the bottom of the cup, let the adventure begin. And I look at the mug. And there's a map of the world in golden. Let the adventure begin. And I was like, no, I'm in a movie. What is happening? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is too good to be yeah. true, you know? Yeah. And this was the beginning. Um, and the second house I went to, it was a lady. And she really, it was like spending the, the evening with a, she was an older lady. Called, and it was like spending the evening with a Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was so, so such a woman of prayer. And, and I was taking a shower. And uh, I saw this beautiful mountain with lakes. And I was reminded of that little postcard of my grandmother, of the mountain with lakes. But I was like, okay, I'm just inventing things now. I'm going a bit too far. I'm coming out of the bathroom. I open the door and right in front of me, there's a beautiful painting of a cliff and a man who is jumping from the cliff. Wow. So I was like, this is not real. Like this life is all pretty, like it's written, he predestined us unto good works. Mm. I really saw that this is all predestined. I'm walking in something that is predestined. So that gave me the strength to go forward into this great journey that the Lord had for me. And this journey, there's many, many stories, but it brought me to 40 different countries in like five years. Wow. It was like opening doors. And I had no social media back then. I was not even uh, supported by that house fellowship. I was really going by faith and the Lord would provide open doors. And maybe we can go in some of the stories, but yeah, it's a, it's a lot of different. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I've, I resonate with that. We had similar things where we started traveling by faith and the Lord confirmed it. And is that something that you think that God called you to, uh, mm -hmm. or is it something he calls his people to? So uh, definitely he called me to do this, something like, like uh, Luke chapter 10. I don't think he called everyone to do this. We see that was this the exact the... scripture that he used for me too. Yeah. <laughs> Luke so he, he does this for not everyone, I believe, but in a way he all wants us to live by faith. As it says, the righteous shall be lived by faith. So living by faith doesn't mean to leave everything and rely solely on, on the Lord. 
so we all must live by faith but yes he all also calls us to sacrifice some things in our life me i had to sacrifice uh, my security my comfort um, many different things so we are all called to sacrifice some things to lay lay down our life and to seek the kingdom put it first but we're not all called to specifically do what i did some people have kids have families and and me by later on also i, I had my wife and so Coming back to this journey after one year of, of traveling by faith and the Lord was really changing my character. Me, I thought I was going to all these places to preach the gospel and lead people to repentance, which it was happening like suicidals, drug addicts, alcoholics, people were coming to repentance, being saved, set free, healed. But really, um, most importantly, what the Lord was doing during all these travels and, and leading me to all these countries, all these continents. He was changing me, it was like tailored made, it was like he was making a garment, tailored made, chiseling me, changing every little detail to really uh, make me more and more in what he wants me to be in his image. And uh, it's, it's an ongoing process, I'm yeah. still going through this process, but he put me in the fire, he put me in really situation that was that terrible way I thought I was gonna die and people was after me and wanted to kill me and different stories like that. What are, what are some of the highlights? Yeah, so um, meeting a man who spent uh, eight years in solitary confinement and he was like uh, really uh, someone who came in my life that God put me with him during... He was a, a Christian? Yeah, he was a Christian new convert who spent eight years in solitary confinement and so he was a big guy, very ruthless and he was like he saw the fear I had because uh, there was um, really some people who were drug addicts uh, at the time and um, they were being hosted by a friend of mine but they were using the name of God to continue being hosted by my friend and receiving some benefits from him and I was warning my friend I said hey these guys are not following Christ they're just using this name to have all these benefits but they're actually using drugs and everything and with my, my, my friend this big guy called Ovrenti they wanted to kill us for this. Mm. So it was putting me through the fire, you know me, I was just like a lamb who didn't go through anything in my life. And so I was going through life-threatening situation and everything the Lord wanted to take, like fear of death, fear of tomorrow, fear of the unknown. He wanted to remove this. And fear of man. Fear of man. Yeah, I see that. He was dealing so many of these things and what happened also later uh, is that I felt like you have to do videos about these different things. Me, me I, I, I knew myself, I knew that I had pride and I was afraid of my pride. And Because I know a lot of people make videos on YouTube and a lot of people just want to promote themselves. And me, I love going this life, seeing how the Lord provides without social media, without uh, doing all these things, promoting myself. So I said, I was in Switzerland at the time, I said, Lord, if this is you, if you really want me to make videos, give me an iPhone 10 so I will know this is from you. I totally forgot about this prayer. Three months later, I meet a man who hardly knows me and I totally forgot about this prayer. And he tells me, hey, Timothy, the Lord spoke to me this morning. He really, f I, I felt that I have a phone, I have an iPhone and I, I want you to also have a phone and I want you to bring you to the Apple store. And he gave me an iPhone 11, and when he gave me this iPhone 11, then I remember the prayer of the iPhone 10 I asked, and God gave me even better than this, and he gave me a MacBook, and then I was like, whoa, you really want me to make videos. So I started to make little videos of the different trips I was doing, and then I was invited at a wedding in Jerusalem, and in this wedding, uh, it was beautiful, it was first time in Israel, and during that wedding, uh, we, they, the guests wanted to go to the Dead Sea and to visit a place up the mountain Matsada and uh, my friend was sick so I told him okay we, we can't climb the mountain so they will go on up the mountain we'll just stay down and as we were there I started to see all these these ruins and it reminded me of the documentary of Ron Wyatt in the 1980s where he, he shows uh, the sulfur, the brimstones all around these places and I was like I think I'm in Sodom and Gomorrah so I was stuck in Israel, it was the first wave of COVID at the time 2020, so I couldn't leave the country. So I was just going back and forth to the Dead Sea to film with the little iPhone 10, and I found the sulfur, the brimstone. So me growing up in France, the unbelief, the doubt, the atheism, to hold in my hands a brimstone from Sodom and Gomorrah, that was 
one of the most beautiful days of my life to see that mm. this is real. And if this story is real, everything, every word, every dot and yota of the word of God is real. Mm. And we lit it on fire and the smell hit my esophagus and I was <coughs> coughing, so I couldn't breathe. It was a piece of coal? A brimstone, a brimstone. sulfur. 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 That, as it's written in Genesis 13 that the Lord rained down fire and brimstone sulfur mm. to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So the science, how you find this sulfur, sulfur 3,000 years later is that it burns so fast that the ash gathered so quickly that it capsulated, it protected the brimstone because as you know, ash doesn't ignite. So it preserved the brimstone for thousands of years of rain erosion has, has lowered the ash and the brimstone came up to the surface. So you can still find it there's very localized areas in Israel at the Dead Sea. Mm. And so I made a documentary about this to show to the world this and it reached boom, millions of people. Like I, I was had really no following really and boom, it was reaching millions of people. I think now it's nearly 4 million people and wow. alcoholics, drug addicts, uh, Buddhists, uh, Muslims, people from all backgrounds saw this and were, I was receiving hundreds of calls like, I want to repent, I want to be baptized. Wow. I need to, no, nobody told me this is real. And so that was also what helped the Lord allow this, these videos to really reach the world. And that also helped people also to, to help me in what the, the mission that we're doing to support because we, I was also doing things in Africa. So that's how also the Lord uh, provided and uh, that was uh, yeah, life changing for mm. me being there. In your video on about reaching the Pygmy tribe, so I was really blessed by how you discipled uh, the leaders and there was a point where you were praying for them and then you started uh, an evil spirit manifest and he got delivered and you could see the change mm. um, and how did you learn it was from that Swiss that same Swiss pastor that you learned to do yeah it's mostly also practice the more that you pray the more that uh, you want to help people really to be free the more you pray the more the the Holy Spirit also helps you to really uh, have the right words and, and recognize what is happening. So it's also really hands-on, mm. like uh, making bread. The more you make bread, you make mistakes, you know, when you right, cook bread, right. you, you maybe burn the bread. The same way when you, you preach the gospel, when you heal the sick, sometimes you make mistakes, sometimes, you, sometimes you, you get it wrong or you have maybe a mistake here, but the more you do it, the more you, you uh, get better at it. Yeah. And uh, it's all about the character. What matters is really to have a heart for these people and not to do it again to promote because there's a lot of people out there healing the sick, casting out demons, promoting themselves. And and we see Jesus in Matthew 7, 22. He will, many of these people, he'll tell them, did I heal the sick? He will tell them, I never knew you. So we should really walk with a lot of caution because it's not because we heal the sick, cast out demons that we are known of the Lord as we see in that verse and so that's why we, we, we do these things, but we focus mostly on, on the character. So what motivates you to share the gospel? What, what motivates you to do what you're doing? So really, uh, is, is what is happening to this, this dying world that is many people do not know about the Lord, they do not have the light of the gospel, and especially in these far and rich places, because we see that Jesus, he said that it is harder for rich men to <laughs> like a camel to enter through the eye of a needle for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. And the same way nowadays, like uh, Europe and the, the US is so much wealth. It's to a point that people don't really need God. And so I saw that really so important to go to the people who have nothing, the least of the last, and the pygmies are literally the least of the last. Uh, you see the documentary how, I mean, this is the people who are one of the last enslaved groups. They are enslaved by the locals. Africans that we consider the poorest people in the world, but actually they are the masters of the pygmies and these people have a life expectancy of 25 years They really uh, It's cold at night. It's so cold in the jungle. People feel Africa is hot. No at night It's super cold and the kids are dying and they they are they, they are dying without hope without the knowledge of Jesus and even if they want to know Jesus because a lot of people are talking about going to uh, the Muslims and in the Middle East and all this but in truth like they have the Bible translated in their language they have access to the internet 
with the pygmies they have no such thing that means that if they want to know the truth if they want to find salvation they cannot they cannot because there's no bible in their language there's no one much scriptures in their language there's no internet there's nothing for them to access jesus so that's why we really want to go to these people mm -hmm. uh, because they are in the greatest need because i travel to 40 countries so i've been to vietnam to the amazon rainforest to many many places i never seen a people like the pygmies who are literally uh, the least of the last uh, well, what motivates you to share the gospel with anybody? So I assume that you still, in the grocery store or wherever here in, in the West, you'll still share the gospel with people. What motivates you to do it? So it's really because people have a limited time on this earth. This, this, the time we have here is very limited and everybody you know, prepares uh, to... You know, we, we had this storm, like you said here, people prepare for the storm and they they, 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 they worry about it and they think about it and they do everything so that they don't get too much hit but nobody prepares for the judgment that is coming which uh, I mean after going as Sodom and Gomorrah seeing the sulfur this has been really a message that the Lord told me to go and share to warn people about the coming judgment when Jesus said like it was in the time of, of Lot so it will be when he comes back so the urgency of the judgment that is coming we never know when is our time and so as much as right now people are doing uh, going to save people and sending helicopters planes mm -hmm. to to save people and that's great we should do that but as much more we should take care of our neighbor care for the lost that is all around us that is dying and without knowing the way of salvation without knowing Jesus Christ or so even if they know Jesus Christ they do not really live for him they are not really uh, lay, lay down their life to follow him. So that's why that motivates me because I feel the urgency. And not just I feel, I don't feel it, but I see in the word of God that we must be pressed with this heart for these people. Unfortunately, the last part of our conversation was cut short because the battery on my camera died, which corrupted the last file. But um, I know that the conversation today was rich. And I believe that many people will be blessed by it. If you were blessed by it, give a like, give, put a fire emoji, leave a comment, share it with somebody so more people can hear the testimony of what God has done in the lives of his people. I'll see you guys next time. God bless.